welcome to Love and Money Secrets TV. I'm your host, Dame Lillian Walker on Becoming Supernatural. And today we are on chapter 14. This is the last chapter of this book. So if you've joined us from the beginning, if you watched a chapter a day, then in theory, you could have probably finished this book in 15 days. Let's get started. Chapter 14, Case Studies. It could happen to you. In this final set of supernatural case studies, please note that none of the people you will read about here tried to make anything happen. They simply had an intention and at the same time surrendered the outcome to something greater. When they hit that moment, whether it was a healing or a mystical experience, their personality wasn't creating an experience. Something greater came through them and did it for them. They connected to the unified field, and it was their interaction with this intelligence that moved them in some way. So as you know by now, after everything you have read in this book, that intelligence also lives within you, divine. Can you hear me? In 2014, Stacy began experiencing severe headaches. For 25 years, she had worked in the healthcare industry as both a registered nurse and an acupuncturist. She had always maintained a healthy lifestyle and rarely took medications. So the sudden appearance of headaches so excruciating, they nearly caused her to black out was alarming. After a year of exploring countless alternative therapies, she finally went to a doctor who ordered a CAT scan. The diagnosis was a meningioma, a benign tumor that wraps around certain nerve tissue in the spinal nerves. Stacy's was sitting on or near her eighth cranial nerve, which began obstructing her acoustic nerve and creating significant changes in her neurological functions. The acoustic nerve has two branches, one for hearing and the other for balance. So in addition to unrelenting pain and loss of hearing, she was dizzy and nauseated. As the lesion grew, it also began pushing against another cranial nerve that ran along her face and continued down into her shoulder, resulting in a diagnosis of pitcher's shoulder. So soon, she also experienced pain in her eye. According to her physician, the only solution was a craniotomy, which basically entailed drilling a large hole in the back of her head to remove the tumor. Stacy did not want to pursue that path, so she continued exploring other healing modalities. So by the time she attended her first weekend workshop in Seattle in 2015, she estimated she had lost 70% of her hearing in her left ear. In the fall of 2016, she attended her first advanced workshop in Cancun, where she felt herself surrender at a whole new level. Then in the winter of 2017, she attended another advanced workshop in Tampa. Upon arrival on Thursday, she had a very intense earache that became much worse the next day. She said the sensation she felt was that her ear was closing up. By the end of that day, after the blessing of the energy centers meditation, her earache curiously ended. Then on Sunday morning, during the pineal gland meditation, Stacy lost track of time and space. I almost felt like I was going to fall off my chair, she said. In that moment, this amazing flash of light consumed the left side of my head. Imagine if you put a thousand diamonds together and shined the light on them, that wouldn't even begin to touch this light. Then boom, her body shot upright and a bluish white light, like nothing she's ever seen or experienced, entered her ear. It was the most divine, loving feeling that I've ever had, she reported. I felt like the hand of God was caressing me with grace. It was so powerful and amazing that I struggled to put it into words, but every time I think of it, I still cry. First, her sinuses cleared, and then the whole left side of her head cleared, and then her left shoulder relaxed and let go. Finally, for the first time in three years, she could hear out of her left ear. I just sat there in awe, laughing and crying as tears flowed down my face, she said. 
music was playing and I could hear it crystal clear. It was as if I could hear the celestial sound of angels singing above the song. I knew what I was hearing was beyond the normal auditory range. And the energy continued to move through the back of the left side of my head, which for years had felt like cement. When I instructed everyone to lie down, relax, and let the autonomic nervous system take the orders, the energy continued to move through Stacy's whole body, down her arms and into her hands. She began to shake uncontrollably, and it was as if I could feel every synapse and muscle in my body firing in my toes, my legs, my head, and my neck and chest. My heart center felt wide open. I just remember thinking, whatever this is, I'm taking the ride. She completely surrendered to the unknown. And once again, she lost track of time and space. So when that portion of the meditation ended, she found herself sitting in her chair with the energy slowing and quieting down. Her thinking brain began to kick in. Even though she could hear, she began to doubt what had just occurred. Perhaps her ear was not totally healed. Perhaps the tumor was still present, or perhaps she wasn't even worthy of healing. No sooner did she have that thought than the energy and light appeared in front of her, but this energy was different. It was red like the heart and blue like energy, and it was three-dimensional. She remembered. It was all about two feet in front of me, and was almost slithering like a snake. All this was happening with my eyes closed. It was multidimensional, beautiful, crazy, gorgeous, fractal, and it came right up to my face. It was almost as if this energy wanted to say, you have doubts? We'll show you. <laughs> then it shot into my heart. My chest opened up and I sat back in my chair and my arms fell wide open. I knew it was the energy of everything, the energy of chi, of spirit, of the divine, of the universe. Life is different now, she told me. For one, my hearing is at a hundred percent, but it's more than that. It's hard to put into words, but I know that no matter what, I'm going to be okay. Life will never be the same because I know underneath everything, it's spirit who is looking to be heard and healed. Janet hears, you are mine. While Janet occasionally meditated, it was never a regular habit. Yet one afternoon, 25 years ago, during a meditation, she had what she calls a spontaneous experience. With her eyes closed, she was suddenly in the presence of an incredibly bright light. Yet the light had a softness that didn't hurt her eyes. She described it as the purest, most intense, perfect love she had ever experienced. For the next 25 years, she prayed, she meditated, and she did everything else she could to try to recreate that transcendental experience. So in the spring of 2015, Janet attended an advanced workshop in Carefree, Arizona. She was in a state of deep depression and exhaustion, unable to see any solutions to the problems in her life. Yet she was determined to have a healing or a breakthrough. Above all else, she was excited to be with more than 500 people united in the belief that they were greater than their physical bodies. So for the duration of that workshop, Janet went after the mystical with a level of intensity that was greater than her and greater than her depression. So during the pineal gland meditation, she was sitting in the lotus position and resting her loving intention in the space of her pineal gland. All of a sudden, the gland activated and a brilliant white light coming from inside her pineal gland, coming from inside her head, illuminated the pineal gland. And it was the same light she had experienced 25 years earlier. 
the light came into the space of my pineal gland and illuminated all the crystals in the little cave of that tiny gland. She later explained, the light continued to illuminate my entire being down to the cellular level. My spine then straightened, my head went back, and I just embraced it. I just let it all happen. I was simultaneously in ecstasy, bliss, gratitude, and love. Next, an inner inverted triangle of light came down from above her through the top of her head. She knew this triangle was the presence of a loving intelligence. The point of the inverted triangle joined the peak of her pineal gland, forming a double geometric shape. The intense frequency of the coherent light was carrying a message for Janet. The light kept saying to Janet over and over, you are mine, you are mine, which she took to mean, I love you more than anything else in the world. Please enter and take charge of my life, Janet responded. And as she surrendered to it, she started to experience a download of information coming through the top of her head in the form of brilliant light. The light was threaded with strands that looked like luminous cobalt blue pearls. The light moved slowly and descended throughout her entire body. This energy was the result of a reverse torus field the field that moves in the opposite direction of the upward field created during the breath. And it was energy from the unified field and beyond the visible light spectrum and beyond our senses. So the inner experience was so real that it rewired her brain and sent a new electromagnetic energetic signal to her body. And in an instant, her past was washed away. The download of the frequency of coherence and wholeness gave her body a biological upgrade. By the time she left the workshop, her depression and her exhaustion were completely gone. This ecstatic experience, she insisted, has changed my life forever. Connected beyond time and space by love. So during a project coherence meditation broadcast from Lake Garda, Italy, participants from all over the world joined us in the belief that we are more than just matter, bodies, and particles, and that consciousness influences matter and the world. So during that meditation, Sasha was in New Jersey visualizing bringing the earth into her heart. When we went to the heart, I felt all these shoots and leaves growing from my heart center and through my body, she told me. There were branches, leaves, and blossoms coming out of my arms, fingers, and my ears, as well as white blossoms all over my face. I had literally become the surface of the earth garden. And as soon as the meditation was over, Sasha looked down at her phone and saw her best friend, Heather, had sent her a picture from Ireland. While, while we had been doing the meditation, Heather had been walking through a garden. She happened to look down and saw moss growing on a rock in the shape of a heart. Heather took a picture of the moss with her phone and sent it to Sasha with a note that said, saw this and had the overwhelming feeling of your presence. Love you. Donna helps souls cross over. When Donna attended her first weekend workshop in 2014 in Long Beach, California, she never would have called herself a meditator. She'd only meditated a handful of times before. And as a technical writer, she had a very analytical mind. But that's the beauty of this work. When you have no expectations, you are more often, you know, more open to where ever the experience takes you. So she was totally taken by surprise when at some point during one of her meditations that weekend, she slipped out of her everyday consciousness and found herself surrounded by hundreds of interdimensional beings. I'm going to pause right here because that's what happened to me at the most unexpected time on March 22nd, which at the end of this video, if you check, you'll see that video linked to this one where I talk about the mystical experience where we together with a lot of my fellow mystics 
all around the globe, we came together on a Sunday morning from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Consecutively, every hour we were meditating. In the last hour, the 2 to 3 o'clock portion of that meditation, I was surrounded by so many interdimensional beings, and it was brought to my attention that I was in the sixth dimension. And there was millions of these dimensional beings. And it was amazing because I, I just, it ne I never occurred to me that they were all the way around me. I just saw from, if, if you were to take like a slice of a pie that was like a wedge, I just saw as far as the eye could see, I could tell that there were millions of them. And, and uh, since, you know, I, you don't really count them, I said, oh my gosh, there's like thousands of you. And then um, they all spoke in unison, but there was one who was like the main one that was like right in front of me. And then all of the, all of the rest that looked, they all looked identical to each other. And as far as the eye could see, and then he said, he goes, there's millions look around you. So then I proceeded to, to do a 360 and look all the way around. And that's when I realized, oh my gosh, it's that same view of millions of them as far as the eye could see. Um, and the colors were, in, were absolutely stunning. They were gorgeous that I saw. It was very light and very iridescent and um, bluish and pinkish. And it's kind of hard to describe because we don't really have that color here. So, I um, mean, it was kind of a pearlescent, pearl, you know, mother of pearlish kind of a coloring that was on them. And so anyhow, so that's, I, I can't say that it was the exact same experience that this person had, but that all I'm sharing with you is what my experience was. And then if you watch the video, you'll hear how then I was escorted into the seventh dimension and then the eighth dimension and then the beings that I came encountered with there. Okay, so moving on. They weren't angry or malevolent, she told me. On the contrary, they're super loving beings. So they weren't angry or malevolent, she told me, but it was very clear to me that they wanted something from me. I'm gonna pause right here because when I interacted with you know, the interdimensional beings of the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth density, they didn't want anything from me. It was pure love. And just as I thought, it's like, wow, this is the greatest form of love that I have ever experienced in my entire life. Surely there can't be anything, any greater love than this. And I was already reeling from that experience in that moment. And then when I went into the you know, they told me it's time to go to the seventh dimension. So I went into the seventh dimension. And just when I thought, it's like, wow, I've just pretty much topped out the maximum amount of love that I could ever experience. I realized, oh my gosh, there's an even greater love. So that was really quite extraordinary. It says they weren't angry or malevolent, she told me, but it was very clear to me that they wanted something from me. So some of them were fairly young, like 12 or 13. I knew immediately they were the people my fiance had killed. Oh, I don't remember reading this the first two times that I read this book. So I'm like, what? So Donna was engaged to a former United States Army Ranger. And during his service in Iraq, he'd been a sniper. So when Donna returned home from the workshop and told her fiance about her experience, he confirmed that some of the people he killed to protect his fellow soldiers were quite young. While she found the connection curious and fascinating, she didn't know what to do with the information, but there was no question in her mind that the experience was real because it was beyond anything she could have simply conjured. Two years later, Donna was at an advanced workshop in Carefree, Arizona. After completing the first meditation, she turned to her friend sitting next to her and said in a daze without even being aware of what she was saying, there are beings in this room and they are here to help us. Early Sunday morning for the pineal gland meditation, Donna was slated to have her brain scanned. Once again, at some point during the meditation, Donna found herself suddenly in the company of the same interdimensional beings who had surrounded her during the first workshop two years earlier. But this time they were standing in a line off to her right. Again, I felt like they wanted something from me, but I didn't know what it was, she said. Then in my mind's eye, as though I was looking through a virtual reality headset, I saw another line forming on my left. There were two types of beings in this line. One type looked human-like, but they were very large and had a shimmery golden 
look and the other types seemed to have a blue hue to them. So she innately knew that if she took the people who were killed by her fiance in the war, who were lined up on the right and gave them to the beings on the left, the people on the right would have received what they needed. Because the people who had been killed by sniper fire had died so suddenly without any warning, some were confused about where they were, alive or dead. Some weren't sure where to go or what to do, while others were trying to stay in this dimension because they were attached to their loved ones and couldn't move on. So they were stuck in between matter and light. Yet somehow they recognized that Donna was the bridge or the facilitator who could help them cross over. And it was all happening in a very real, very lucid experience. So to say I handed them over to the other beings is not quite right, she explained, but it was something like me passing them over. It really, it's really beyond language, but when they passed to the other side, it seemed like they passed through the other beings. And then I could see them running across a field of waist high red mist. I could feel all the freedom, joy, and happiness they were experiencing as they ran across the field. Again, as if looking through a virtual reality headset, Donna turned to the right in her mind's eye and saw a winding dirt road filled with people stretching far into the distance. She sensed they were from Bosnia and Serbia, which she couldn't quite make sense of. It felt almost as if the word got out. I didn't have the sense that they were unaware they were dead. It was more like they were stuck in limbo. They didn't know how to get to the other side. This was the longest meditation of the workshop, perhaps two to three hours, but to Donna, it seemed like it was 10 minutes. Donna attended another advanced workshop in Cancun in the fall of 2016, period. I gotta say, there's something magical about that location of Cancun. And when I was in the monastery in just last year, 2019, when I arrived first to Cancun, there's just something different about the air there. And I later learned that that city is only like 50 years old. So it's a, it's a, probably, it's probably one of the newest cities I've ever been to in my entire life. I was pretty shocked to hear that they were celebrating their 50th anniversary of being a city. And I thought, oh my gosh, so, it's like, it's basically my whole lifetime. So I thought that's kind of crazy that it's such a young city, but I kind of felt like there was a lot of history there. So, and of course, before it was founded into a formal modern city of Cancun, there obviously were Indians and there were ruins that I visited while I was there. But all that to say, there's, I think there's something very magical there because one of the things that I learned while I was there is that they have these things called cenotes. So on top of the fact that they're in the Mayan Riviera, so they're a beach community on the water, you know, it's a beach town. So there's inherently a large body of water there, but they have hundreds, not just 50 or 60, they have hundreds of these cenotes, which are like these, they're underground rivers and they open up into mineral spring water water holes or mineral spring baths, not lakes, but they're just like openings in the earth where, you know, it's like a little, like a little lake, if you will, or a little, not so little spring. It's like, you know, a medium or a larger size pool, but it's a naturally occurring phenomena. And some of them are hot, some of them are warm, and some of them are just kind of room temperature. So there's a tremendous amount of water. So both by the sea as well as underground and through all these openings. So if you know anything about energy and you know any, anything about how water is programmable, you will know that this is no small thing. There's a tremendous amount of energy that is flowing through that area. And I think that gives, it's, gives way to a lot of supernatural things um, taking place and a greater amount of energy flowing in that area because of that. During my experience during the seven day story with Dr. Joe, I had incredible experiences that took place. If you have an opportunity to sign up to go to one of his seven day advance, I would highly encourage you to do that because it will change your life and you will, and you just have to show up 
even if you have, like I had things that needed to be healed, you know, my traumatic vein injury, my neck, my back, blah, 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 all sorts of things. There's the obvious things and then there's the less obvious, obvious things, you know, everybody has emotional, you know, kind of stuff that, you know, you traumas that you've had in the past that you need to heal. So, but if you just show up and you're just open hearted and you're just willing to, to dive in deep into the experience and surrender to it all, I think that's where the magic really occurs because you can't be attached to an outcome, even though your intention, you're showing up with the intention to heal and to experience something mystical. Really the key to all of this work is just being unattached to the outcome and allowing that infinite source intelligence that knows what is the optimized best solution for you. So when you trust it, you're really trusting yourself because when your inner being is aligned with it, wow, that is really where the supernatural magic does begin. And, and then it never stops as you continue to make that choice and you decide that that's the state of being that you want to reside in, then you trust in the infinite source intelligence. You know that everything happens for your highest good. Even the things that are not as pleasant, you realize it's there for your benefit and that it's oftentimes rerouting you or redirecting you or keeping you on the right path of where you wanna, where you wanna be, you know, with person, places or things. So, and then one other thing, yeah, we do these meditations, they're two, three, four, five hours, and it does not feel like two, three, four, five hours. It, you don't feel time. I'm not surprised at all that she felt that 10 minutes had gone by and it was like two to three hours that had gone by because you really get lost and you go somewhere and you don't even know where you are. You're like, where did, where, where was that? It was, you know, it was super far away, but you have no idea where it is. I mean, with the exception of, unless they tell you, like in my, that one experience where they told me you're in the sixth dimension and I'm like, what, sixth dimension? So if they tell you that's different, but that's been the only time I've been told where I was. Usually I go and I have no idea where I am. And I, I, I think it is, it's most of my friends that we've talked about this stuff. You go and you don't know where you're going and it's fine. It's not scary at all. It's very wondrous. Donna attended another advanced workshop in Cancun in the fall of 2016. And this time when I asked the students to surrender their consciousness, to merge with the consciousness of the unified field, Donna had the experience of becoming the universe. So she went from the consciousness of somebody, something, somewhere. <laughs> I got a little tongue tied there. So she went from the consciousness of somebody, something, someone, somewhere and some time to the consciousness of nobody, no thing, no one, nowhere and no time to the consciousness of everybody, everything, everyone, everywhere, every time. So in the instant, her consciousness connected with the unified field, the field of information that governs the laws and forces of the universe, she became the universe. She was in bliss. Since that experience, my life has become magical and I'm experiencing a new energy and vitality like never before, she reported later. I keep having one powerful experience after another, and I can never go back to the way my life was before starting to practice this work. I'm gonna have to say, I second that motion and ditto. And um, I, I remember having um, a discussion with this guy a couple years ago where he said, oh, you know, cause I said, you know, you can't unring that bell. Once you ring that bell, you can't go back to not knowing, to not, you know, you just can't go backwards. And he says, oh yes, you can. From where I sit in my experience, you can't go to a place of not knowing what you know. Now, if you choose to disconnect yourself with, um, you know, I don't know, with whatever, whether it doesn't matter if it's over the counter, prescribed, legal, illegal drugs, then probably you can either disconnect yourself, you know, obviously drugs by their sheer nature of being drugs, they automatically disconnect you, unfortunately. That being said, if you have an open heart and you are doing this practice and you are on prescription drugs because you have a medical condition that requires you to be on those drugs, make no mistakes. The infinite source intelligence knows how to get around that and keep you connected despite that. There isn't anything that this infinite source intelligence 
can't get around because it is the all, it is the great I am, it is the infinite. So what limitations does infinite have? It has no limitations. It's infinite in every expression and every realm and every degree and every dimension and every density and every verse, multiverse, universe. There is no limitations to infinity, my friends. There isn't. So even if you have steel rods in your back or you have a ceramic um, hip joint or pins in your ankles, I kind of feel like somebody has a lot of pins in their ankles right now. Whatever the case might be, guess what? That infinite source intelligence, it can get around all of that and it can heal you despite that. You can be completely free of pain, of tension, of stiffness, of whatever your, your circumstances are. There isn't anything outside of the grasp or the realm of infinite source intelligence. And that, my sweet friends, is the great news that the energy and power that made you, that puts you together, can heal you. It can do and undo and get around anything and everything, anywhere, anytime, any place with anything. It's greater than everything, everything and anything you've ever seen with your natural eyes and even with your inner eye. So that's that's pretty spectacular. I mean, there's no limits. Moving on, chapter 14. Tick tock, tick tock. Not much time left here. Jerry returns from the brink of death. Okay, on August 14th, 2015, Jerry was putting a project together on his back deck. And as he was reading the directions, he felt a sudden sharp pain right below his sternum. His, this is right here. This bone right here is your sternum. I'm sorry, that's your clavicle. This is your sternum. He thought perhaps it was gas. So he took some medication, but it didn't go away. And I'll pause right here. Ladies and gentlemen, Okay, I, I have a, back out, a background in pre-med biological sciences, and I worked as a, as a paramedic and emergency medical technician for many years for a private ambulance company. In fact, that's part of how I put myself through school when I was in the university. And if, if you have these symptoms of your feeling sharp pain in your sternum, especially if you're a male, if you have the symptom of pain, sharp pain, dull pain, and it doesn't go away after you take a Tylenol or an Advil or acetaminophen. And in his case, he thought it was perhaps gas, perhaps gas, that those are the warning signs of you having a heart attack. So don't play with that. Don't worry about being embarrassed, going to, you know, it's better it's better to go and err on the side of safety than, than to save face. You're like, oh, I don't want to be embarrassed. And then you end up on a stretcher and now they have to do open heart surgery because you waited too long. They could have maybe stopped it and changed the rhythm of your heart so that you wouldn't be having a heart attack. And now all they have to do is there's a few little things that they can do that can remedy that and provided that you don't have any blockages in any of the arteries of the heart, uh, you can be okay. And then of course, that's a red flag to you where your body's going, help, lifestyle change. You know, you need to do some pretty serious lifestyle changes. Anyhow, I just want to make sure that you guys know that that is not something to ignore. And the same thing, if you have pain on, in your left arm, and it, you know, these type of symptoms are different in women than in men. Sometimes women have like their, their right side of their jaw will hurt. Believe it or not, it has nothing to do with your teeth or anything like that. That's actually a symptom of a heart attack in a female. So Google it, look up the symptoms for female versus male, know them, not just for yourself, but for your loved ones that are around you, your friends, your family, your neighbors. If any of them tell you, hey, I've, I've had this pain for two days and aspirin isn't getting rid of it. And um, I know a twin who she saved her twin's life because her cardiologist had informed her, hey, you know, if, if you're a female and you have this bad neck pain that won't go away, 
and in her, this girl's case, her twin was having bad neck pains. She was feeling a lot of pressure in the base of her neck and she took Advil and it was two, this is the second day and she's still suffering with this pain. And her twin said, what? She goes, you need to go immediately to the emergency room. They took her to the emergency room and guess what? She was, she had been having a heart attack and was completely unaware. Had her twin not said anything to her, she could have died of a heart attack. Pay attention, <sighs> pay attention. This guy, Jerry, thought perhaps it was gas. So he took some medication, but it didn't go away. Instead, he lay down to rest and it got worse. By the time he tried to get up, he started losing his ability to stand and thought that he might pass out. As the pain became more intense and his breath and breathing grew shorter, he called an ambulance. With all his might, he dragged himself about 15 feet outside to the driveway so the paramedics wouldn't have to kick in his door. Kneeling on the driveway, he collapsed, waiting for the emergency medical technicians. When they arrived, they assumed he was having a heart attack and immediately began to follow that protocol. You guys don't understand. I'm having a real hard time breathing, he told them. We have to get to the hospital right away. Jerry knew what he was talking about. He'd worked for 34 years as a medical technician in the, in the very emergency room where they were about to take him. Jerry knew everyone in the ER, and once he arrived, doctors, nurses, technicians, and specialists began frantically running lab work on him. When a doctor, who was also Jerry's friend, told Jerry that the red flags had come up in every test administered, Jerry knew things were not looking good. One test in particular was particularly alarming. His levels of protease, amylase, and lipase enzymes that are produced by the pancreas were 4,000 to 5,000 units per liter, way above the norm of about 100 to 200. They put Jerry in the intensive care unit. The pain soon worsened and none of the drugs they were giving me worked. Jerry said, they told me that a duct to my gallbladder had been blocked and it was causing trouble in my pancreas. Worst of all, fluid started to develop in my lungs. I was now down to 80% breathing capacity in both lungs. That's when the doctors put me on a ventilator and I knew things were bad. The doctor then asked his team to turn on the TV to Boston, allowing the doctor to have an immediate teleconference with another doctor in a larger hospital in the nearest big city. So in all the time I'd worked at the hospital, I'd only seen the TV to Boston come on a few times for the most serious of traumas or for people who are dying. Jerry said, it means they have no idea what is happening. When a doctor you have trusted for years tells you they don't know what's going on, well, that's when my stress hormones just started to kick into high gear. While all of this was happening, the medical staff told Jerry's wife that if there was any end of life paperwork, she needed to get it in order. Now would be the time to go home and get it. She left sobbing. Jerry soon realized he needed to start taking care of himself. He knew that if he allowed the stress hormones to start taking over, he was not gonna win. So I went from being a guy who hadn't been sick in years who did yoga all the time and ate well, to all of a sudden being in the ICU. I kept telling myself, I can't go down this road. I can't give in to the fear, so I didn't. Since he'd recently read my book, You Are the Placebo, he started thinking, I gotta change these thought patterns. I can't allow these thoughts to make more cortisol to get into the body and start doing more damage to what's left of me. The doctors, eventually found out that Jerry had a large mass blocking a duct in his pancreas. The mass was not letting the mucus drain, so everything in the gland was backing up and spilling over into his bloodstream. My doctor stayed with me for three days straight, he says. They put an oxygen mask on me because I couldn't breathe. I had IVs on both sides. And meanwhile, I kept thinking, watch your thoughts relax put something into the quantum field that's going to help you and not hurt you 
because you're already knocking on the door. I'm gonna be okay. This too shall pass. I'm gonna be all right. Whenever he was conscious, Jerry placed his energy on overcoming himself, changing his state of being and creating a different outcome, constantly tuning into a different potential in the unified field. I'm gonna pause right here. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the epitome of self-mastery. This is the work that you need to do to heal yourself in any way, shape, or form. This is the work of self-mastery that you need to do to manifest anything that you want. This is the work of self-mastery that you need to do to solve whatever business problems, to solve whatever relationship problems, to solve whatever challenges you have in um, work environments, uh, family environments. I don't care if you have some sort of problem at work and you're at a quandary on how am I going to figure this out? If you have a problem, there is at least three solutions to that problem unbeknownst to you. You may not be aware of what the solution is, but any problem, any challenge, any obstacle, any hurdle for you to overcome, make no mistakes. There are no less than three. There's three, four, or more available. But as you focus on the problem, the problem looks bigger. So if instead your questioning turns to how do I attract solutions so that I can overcome this situation, so I can get on the other side, so I can get on top of this, and so that I can use this as a stepping stone to launch me higher, to higher ground. Make no mistakes, when life throws crap at you, you can do one of two things. You could sit there and wallow in the crap, pardon my French. I know for some people the word crap can be offensive. <laughs> it's actually one of my favorite words because to me, crap is fertilizer. Life gives me crap, I take it, I mix it up with a little bit of dirt, and now it's fertilized, it's fertilizer. And I'm gonna use it to plant seeds and to make beautiful things grow, because make no mistake, I recognize that no experience is wasted. Things don't happen at me, they all happen for me. So even the most awful situations, there are wonderful things that have come from those awful things. And so what happens? I bear fruit from those really unpleasant circumstances. And then oftentimes I have a tree. So instead of being at the bottom of the pit now, now I have a tree that I can climb and I'm able to jump up to another level because I used the crap as fertilizer to mix it in with the dirt. And I planted seeds and that tree sprouted up right away. And then I was able to get myself to another level. If you don't know how to do that yet, you actually do know how to do this. It's inside of you. And you're like, oh, well, what do you mean inside of me? You just have to quiet yourself down and be one with yourself, just as Jerry is doing here. He didn't allow his egoic mind to run away with him as it's like, oh, I'm dying and, and um, have the negative thought patterns that was going to increase the stress levels and the cortisol levels that were just going to destroy what was left of him. He decided, I'm going to be okay. I'm gonna be fine, I've got this. I'm gonna turn my thoughts around. I'm gonna create the feelings of love inside of my body. I'm gonna embrace the love that I have in my heart. I'm gonna feel the feeling of love expanding through every cell of my body because that is healing your body. That's doing the work, which some people think is not doing anything and it's actually doing the greatest thing that we could ever do. Fortunately, Jerry, he had a private room giving him plenty of opportunity to do his meditations whenever he wanted to. So Jerry spent a week in the ICU and by the end of that time, when he moved to a progressive care unit, the oxygen mask was gone and Jerry was walking around. Even so, he could not eat or drink anything for nine weeks. I'm gonna pause right there. Every time I read this, it gives me a flashback because I never counted how many weeks it was, but it was months that I was in the hospital trying to salvage the pregnancy that I had with my first child. I was put on bed rest early on at uh, 24 weeks, and then he was born at 
32 and a half weeks, trying to get to 36 weeks. As you know, for ge full gestation is 40 weeks, but he was born a little over two months early. So he was born at 32 and a half weeks, almost 33 weeks. Long story short, I went weeks without um, basically being able to eat because they put you on all these meds and you're in the hospital with IVs and all that kind of good stuff. You know, you do what you have to do. So it says here, even so he could not eat or drink anything for nine weeks. If he ate anything or even had water, his pancreas would release acid into his body, eventually killing him. The only nourishment he received was through an IV. When Jerry was admitted to the hospital, he weighed 145 pounds. Good grief, he was already skinny. When he was discharged, he weighed 119. When he finally went home, still with an IV pole, he continued to do the work. As October drew near, the mass was still present. His doctor suggested he see a specialist in Boston to undergo surgery because Jerry was a medical professional. Two days before the surgery, he suggested his medical team take some more tests and scans so the doctors would have the most up-to-date information. I know all the x-ray technicians, and yet when they told me I no longer had a mass, I didn't believe them. I called in the radiologist and the doctors. They said, just kept saying, Jerry, we're looking at your film right now. We're telling you there's nothing there. I'm calling the guys in Boston to tell them there will be no surgery. Jerry later realized that by constantly raising his energy, moving into a feeling of health and changing the thoughts and belief that he was that he was sick to the thoughts and belief he was going to be fine the higher frequency caused him to heal i'm going to read that again jerry later realized that by constantly raising his energy moving into a feeling of health and changing the thoughts and belief that he was sick to the thoughts and belief he was going to be fine the higher frequency caused him to heal. I wasn't going to allow myself to think, woe is me, this is gonna be bad. I kept working on this every day for as much of the day as I could. I put the right message, intention and energy out into the quantum field to heal myself and eventually did. Some of you are, have been studying this book, Becoming Supernatural. And it's because you're suffering from some sort of chronic disease, chronic illness, chronic pain, chronic trauma. There's obviously something that is not quite right. Or maybe you're chasing the mystical experiences and you're trying to become more conscious, more ascended and so forth. And the key to all of this work really is in mastering of yourself and distinguishing very clearly the difference between your focused awareness you know there's the awareness of you that when you can isolate that much easier at the beginning when your eyes are closed once you've done it enough times with your eyes closed and then you begin to do it with your eyes open then you can distinguish whether your eyes are opened or your eyes are closed but you got to start somewhere so the first trick is to recognize that your awareness and then the focused awareness is in fact separate from the brain because the brain is the organ that interprets the mind's vibrations past thoughts feelings and emotions that are lodged in your body primarily and the interpretation of the vibrational frequencies that are around you through your sense of sight smell gustatory taste hearing and then tactile senses and then of course your intuition which is coming from your heart space so when you recognize the thoughts of the brain and then the thoughts of your ego, which is a subset of your brain's mind, and you can distinguish the thoughts of the brain and the ego separate from the thoughts of your focused awareness, then now you can take charge of your mind and your ego and you can use your brain as, as your servant. Now you, the focused awareness are the master of the brain. Instead of allowing the brain to be your master along with your ego and to it be the one that's ruling the roost based on whatever paradigms and based on whatever conditioning and programming you've had from the past that probably doesn't serve you. 
and you're on default programming with all the underlying programs that most you're not even aware of now consciously you go oh wait a minute that's the ego talking oh that's my old personality my old brain going off of the default programming no that's not we're not doing that we used to do that we're not doing that anymore i am your master you're the brain you do as i say and we're going to command the autonomic nervous system now to yada 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 and it's that work Anytime you think, well, I can't do this. What am I doing wrong? Everybody else has figured how to do this except me. Um, you know, oh my gosh, you know, how much worse is this going to get? Anything that's negative, anything that is not a loving thought that is loving towards you and your body is a thought that you need to put at bay and you need to say, ah, no. Um, and if your body starts to have pain or your body starts to shake or your body's behaving in ways that that are a loss of energy like i talked about earlier in the book my experience when i was in cancun and i was doing that that walk from one side of the platform to another you know it's an eye beam that's 50 feet up in the air and it's it was the width of my foot and my leg started shaking and even though i wasn't thinking that i was afraid but my body was starting to react and I felt like my body was betraying me. And when I realized that my legs were shaking, I'm like, that's an energy leak. I cannot afford to be wasting energy on anything other than I have to have all my focus to awareness so that I can accomplish my goal, which is to safely with, you know, maintaining my balance, walking across on this I-beam so I could get to the other side. And the same thing is true for you. So all of this work all has to do with self mastery. I really want us to continue using the comments below. I'm going to come back and revisit and we'll probably do a more advanced study of this particular book, Becoming Supernatural, because this book is basically a textbook. It is a book that you will not just read once. You'll have to read it over and over again. This is my third reading. And I can say that there were things that I read this time that I didn't remember reading the first two times. And so they stood out this time for me. And I'm glad that I had this opportunity to read it this time with you guys and to share it so that you could be along in this portion of my journey. And so I would love to hear your feedback on each and every one of these chapters and chapter 14, as you conclude this chapter and as you put these things into practice and as you relate to some of the people and their stories in here, I would love to hear your stories. And if you are successful in doing these meditations, and there's no such thing as a bad meditation as Dr. Joe says. So if you were able to um, start to see manifestations in your life where you started to feel that feeling of peace, or you feel, or you're able to get to that place where you're no one, nobody, nowhere, no thing, no place, nowhere and no time where you're actually in the black, in the void. Sometimes people have, have said to me it's like well exactly how do you do that how is it that you're in you know in the blackness and and you know is it outer space well for me i kind of feel like it is outer space but i kind of feel like you go beyond outer space into this black void where it really isn't it's just pitch black and another way of thinking about that void and and that level of blackness if you will is to just make believe that you are in a very dark movie theater and make believe that the lights are all turned off and that the screen that's in front of you is completely black. There you are quite literally in the void, but being in that black void, you it's, you know, it's all around you. It's 360 degrees so that you are aware of the space of the void above your head, below your feet, behind you to inf like infinitely behind you. It's, it's a black void that goes and spans out in infinity in every direction. It's like, think of us, think of a ball or a sphere. And so when you're looking at a sphere, it's radiating out. So it's infinity in every direction, as if you were inside, as if you were an energy ball and it's radiating out infinitely in every direction, kind of like the sun. So that's probably the best, the best way to describe it in my opinion.
that concludes chapter 14. Thank you for being part of this live broadcast here on Love and Money Secrets TV. I thank you. It's been um, a joy and an honor and a pleasure to interact with you all. And I hope that you tune in, tap in, turn on for our next book. Our next book that we are going to read is Breaking the Habit of Becoming Yourself. So you're going to be breaking the habit of being you, basically. And that's a book that this book uh, mentioned. And I think it's a, it's a wonderful continuation. Some of you already read that book, and this is the second one. For me, this was the first book that I read. And so I hope that you'll want to tune in, tap in, and turn on to that as well. So that's it. Thank you. Ciao for now. Please do like this video, comment, and subscribe so that you get updates as to our uh, other programs that we're going to put together for you. And all I can say is ciao for now.